Welcome everybody to today's webinar. It's a quarter to 12 here in the Netherlands, so I would like to start um, off. Today our webinar is called Towards Better Cities with Water, Nature and You. My learning moments during 10 years of rubbing shoulders with stakeholders. So my name is Lenneke Knoop, I am from the Water Channel and this webinar is part of the webinar series IHE Delft Online Seminars for Alumni and Partners in cooperation with the Water Channel. So a very special welcome to all IHE alumni and partners. And before handing over to the speaker of today, I would like to mention a few things as usual. So this is an interactive webinar and um, you see in the bottom right corner a chat panel. This is the place where you can type in your questions regarding um, the presentation. You can do that throughout the whole webinar and then after the presentation, we will compile them and post them to the speaker one by one. I would also like to ask you if you can share your name, your organization and your expertise in the chat box just to see who is inside and to have a clue who is who. And a final note uh, on my side, the recordings and the presentation will be shared afterwards at the waterchannel.tv. So our speaker today is Dr. Asela Patirana, Associate Professor of Integrated Urban Water Cycle Management at IHE Delft. And Dr. Asella is a civil engineer and hydrologist by background. I am very excited by Tupac because he's going to address something that I recognize and I'm sure many of us recognize and have experienced before. So in this webinar, Dr. Asella will explain his practical experience related to stakeholders. No theory or complex diagrams, but his own experience from the past 10 years that he learned on the job. Of course, this is all centered around water challenges. So what are the crucial learning moments of Dr. Asella that could benefit us and other water experts when moving around in the seemingly complex water arena? So I'm happy to hand over to Dr. Asella right now to answer this question and also to discuss many more other things. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you Lenneke for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, and greetings um, uh, from the wintry Netherlands. Uh, I'm uh, going to spend about, let's say, 30 minutes uh, of your time trying to share some of my uh, experiences dealing with this very interesting world of, you know, stakeholders. As um, Lenica pointed out, I'm not a social scientist. I'm a civil engineer to start with, and then if you look at uh, my research interests, the areas I have worked on are largely in domains like uh, modeling related to urban water cycle issues, uh, numerical uh, problems. So my comfort area is there. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is to, to open up to a different set of experiences that I have had over the, let's say, last 10 to 13 years that I worked at IHE in the domain of stakeholders in the water world. So let's start uh, this discussion by asking why. Why stakeholders have become so important today? Then let's very uh, briefly touch upon how and what. So uh, I firmly believe that if you understand the why of a certain issue, Usually that gives a lot of uh, encouragement for you to address the how and what of that eventually. So starting with why. Now uh, in the introduction you heard that my domain of work is urban water cycle. So most of my examples come from that domain. So if you look at what's happening to cities around us whether they are in Asia, Latin America, Africa, or any part of the developing world, what you will see is a very common phenomena of very rapid growth or explosive growth of these cities. The environment we are living in, in the cities are changing extremely fast. To give an example, one of my favorite case studies, that is the city of Kanter, in Vietnam. If you look at this city that is on the bank 
of the Mekong River. You clearly understand that there are several drivers that are affecting the water security of the city. Upstream flow changes, downstream sea level effects, and also the local changes that are happening in the city. So this is a very complex situation. And uh, as a result, you can see a lot of uh, flood problems, among other things, are happening in the city. Now, this is, these are results of some of uh, the modeling studies that we have done uh, around in 2012-2013 about these cities. Um, so we tried to provide a certain prognosis about the future of the flooding problem of the city. So we come up with certain ideas and uh, how the flood uh, volume, the flood extent or the flood depth in the city will change in the future under different scenarios. Now, when you look at this kind of picture, uh, it is very easy to get hooked on to the idea that we know what's happening, what's going to happen in our future. However, it's always important to remember that um, while it's extremely important for us to try to understand what's going to happen in the future, at the same time we have to remember that there are certain things that are very difficult for us to pinpoint exactly, like uh, issues like climate change, issues like urban growth, all these things compound on each other, providing a very uh, complex situation when it comes to predicting what happens in the future. Now, this is a fun example that I use in uh, certain situation to show uh, how good we are as a species in predicting our future. This is the real data from the uh, time of the oil crisis in 70s. So people started uh, making predictions using a lot of state-of-the-art those days models uh, about how the uh, oil price will develop into the future. They made certain predictions and this was the reality. And they made other set of predictions later, this was the reality. So what you will see here is a classic example of the, in spite of using a lot of sophisticated and state-of-the-art techniques, models and so on, we are still unable to grasp in a deterministic way what's going to happen in the future. I'm not saying that this is a useless exercise. This is extremely useful and essential exercise, but at the same time we have to remember that what we see in this kind of results is not the one reality, but certain possibilities. So, when we look at our water problems in cities, what we see is there are certain virtual certainties, that is our external forcings like climate change and internal drivers like urban growth are going to increase. So this is a virtual certainty. We all know it and there is no point of arguing about it because there is a lot of solid scientific evidence that that is going to happen. But at the same time, we have to remember the exact nature and magnitude of those changes are far from certain. So we are in a very unenviable situation here. We have to deal with a combination of very urgent problem. I call it urban adaptation problem, or you can call it climate adaptation problem if you like. It's a very urgent problem. We have to do it today. But we have to do it while being uh, highly uncertain about what exactly is going to happen. So this combination is a certain vicious combination that we have to live it in the reality of the water problems. So how to act? I'm sure you have seen many examples where in the, uh, in the face of these uncertainties, we just ignore the future. And that is, we all agree, is not a responsible way to deal with this situation. 
and sometimes what we do is we assume a non-existent predictability that is we look at one scenario about the future and we think that okay let's just take this scenario as the reality and make some concrete plans to address that scenario so we look at the urgency but we forget the uncertainty and that's also not very responsible but i suggest that there is an alternative let's talk about that now my proposition again remember that i come from the urban water domain my proposition here is that so called uh, green solutions that we are talking about a lot these days uh, nature based solutions green blue, uh, uh, green blue solutions sustainable drainage systems these things are suitable for addressing this uh, wicked and complex situation of adaptation in the context of uncertainty together with urgency so that is my proposition and let's start looking at it i'm sure you all are familiar with the contours of what green solutions are in cities and in water problems in general uh, in cities we use for example if you want to manage the flooding issue in the city you can use uh, solutions like rain gardens vegetated swells urban wetlands uh natural detention areas these are green solutions one of the interesting points about green solutions is that even though most of the time we develop these solutions uh to address a certain problem like flooding for example or uh, natural water treatment almost always we get variety of benefits from these solutions so we call this Uh, multiple benefits now the slides i was going through while explaining this was a case study from singapore where we use um uh, state of the art modeling techniques together with uh, uh, artificial intelligence and things like that to come up with very optimal and uh, suitable designs for this kind of green solution Uh, but what i want to talk about is not about all this modeling and artificial intelligence but i want to start with a metaphor now imagine that you are worried about your health in the future now this is a good example for a urgent but uncertain problem because we all know that we are going to get old and eventually we are going to get sick if you are lucky when we get old if you are unlucky if you are unlucky earlier so that's a certainty but at the same time we don't know what exact disease that we are going to succumb to so uh, if i propose to you that you know you should take action against um, uh, heart attacks or diabetes you know specifically you will laugh at me because that is not the way you do do these things you you look at your health as a overall problem and you rather do exercise maybe manage your diet and buy your general health insurance so this is exactly the kind of solutions that we are promoting in the green infrastructure as well because in the cities we have a lot of we have plethora of water problems but it's okay to start pointing out a problem from the viewpoint of flooding because i belong to a group here called flood resilience group so i talk a lot about flooding or sometimes about drought about water resources lack of water for citizens you can start your point of departure can be any of these points but then when we look at the problem a complex problem that is both urgent and uncertain there's no point of getting hooked into one uh, objective only look at it as a whole holistic problem and try to uh, come up with solutions that work uh, no matter what that is why 
I started with the proposition that maybe green solutions is a good good uh, point to address this uh, unenviable situation we are in, uh, trying to manage our future in the water world. Now, to come back to the issue of green infrastructure in cities, you know, whether you create a piece of infrastructure for managing floods or managing uh, droughts uh, or managing water quality, at the same time you get a plethora of benefits like recreation, uh, even things like social cohesion, education sometimes if you do it right, uh, flood control obviously, water resources, so all these things come together. So what we are looking at is something like exercising against getting sick or buying a general health insurance against getting sick. We are not focusing on uh, you know, specific disease in the case of that metaphor or a particular sp you know, specific problem in case of urban adaptation. So some of the examples here very quickly. Even urban agriculture is gaining a lot of popularity around the world. Now to go to a case study very quickly, this is a case study from uh, Latin America, Montevideo, Uruguay. So here what we try to do is we try to estimate all these benefits that we gain from uh, solutions, green solutions that we primarily implement to manage floods. So if you look at only the floods, you can see that there is a threshold below which the investments give a positive return. But after that, they don't give a positive return because the flood protection alone does not justify investment more than this point. But the moment you consider all the other uh, benefits, by the way there are uh, accepted ways of estimating these benefits and give them a financial value today. What you see is you can, you can justify much larger investments because you consider all these benefits starting from social cohesion all the way to urban agriculture, starting from urban heat mitigation all the way to flood mitigation. If you look at all these benefits then you can justify much bigger investments. But the point I was trying to make in this long winded justification is that when you look at urban green infrastructure and their multiple values, what you have to understand is all those things are interconnected. You know, single purpose infrastructure is a little bit outdated today. So whether you want to address flooding, whether you want to address uh, water resource in cities or pollution, whatever you do, it's beneficial to look at what kind of other benefits can you make out of that, uh, out of that project or the activity. For that it's very important to understand that the systems are interconnected. So, why stakeholders? The simple answer is that if you look at multiple values of these uh, green solutions that we propose in the modern day, what you realize is these multiple values are intimately connected to a variety of stakeholders. You can build a uh, big pipeline, underground pipeline and not worry too much about stakeholders because the pipeline will be buried anyway and the connection between that pipeline and the relevant stakeholders will be, uh, will not be that strong at least after the construction of that probably. But if you look at for example urban wetland in the middle of an apartment complex. Imagine you can you can never probably succeed in implementing that kind of system with multiple benefits unless you understand who are the people interested in that solution because the, these are intimately connected with multiple stakeholders 
that is why stakeholders are so important in this business of uh, urban adaptation using green infrastructure. Now, some time back we were doing some theoretical work on uh, try to get into grips with this problem of complex problem of urban adaptation and we came up with four requirements that you need uh, to to address these issues uh, that depict uh, the combination of high uncertainty and uh, high urgency like climate adaptation in cities if you look at these four principles you can see that in two of them there's a very big prominence to stakeholders like what we we use this term virtual worlds here. What we mean is like things like models, things like simulation models, simulation games. They should be understood and accepted by all stakeholders. And all stakeholders and working and learning together is very important. So th this is where these two worlds come together. So <clears throat> now let's move quickly into what and how. So here I'm going to share with you some of uh, my anecdotal experiences, you know, some of the learning points that I had in the last 10 years or so. We come back to the city of Kantar. You remember that from the beginning of the presentation. Now, here, in this city, flooding happens once uh, once in few months sometimes. In, during the flood season, it's normal sometimes to have, you know, small floods 20 times around somewhere in the city. So, a um, lot of us were uh, highlighting this situation and saying that, you know, people have developed resilience to live with water. So, that, that was our uh, headline, so to say. But later, we started uh, doing some investigations about the water quality of these floodwaters. And what we realize is that in this situation, they are, while they are living together with floods, if you look at the water quality of that floodwaters, actually it is not a very healthy situation. So what is the relationship of this to the stakeholder story? The relationship is, you know, the knowledge does not come, you know, spontaneously first uh, in stakeholder context. You have to look around, you have to look at multiple disciplines. I mean, earlier we were looking at the flood from the point of view of flood damage, economic damage, hydraulics, and so on. But the moment we look at it from the water quality angle, you start seeing a very different world there. That is very important. And another example from a European city, you know, this beautiful park was uh, apparently designed by a, a famous landscape architect. Yeah. And but the the city uh, officers explained to us that uh, people do not like this park. They complain that, you know, frogs are making a lot of noises. Why do you have this jungle in the middle of the city and so on? So then after scratching my head a little bit, I asked the question, when did you involve the residents in the decision-making process of designing this park? Due to some practical reasons, apparently, that did not happen. So it's, it's very clear that, you know, stakeholder engagement should not come as an afterthought. But it's very important that you involve uh, the concerned stakeholders, including the communities, but not limited, from the beginning of a project. That is very important. <coughs> now, another example from another corner of the world, from Indonesia, city of Sulawesi. Uh, city of Kendari in the island of Sulawesi, sorry. Um, I was doing some, you know, stakeholder engagement sessions. Uh, so we had about this 50 group of people from all different disciplines and all walks of life, including citizens, 
but not limited government workers and uh, different types of experts. So we were doing what we call co-design and co-learning workshops. And then I noticed that there was this lady who uh, was not joining the tables around. She was just uh, waiting. I asked her what is, what is going on. Then she told me something very interesting, but later I realized something profound. That is, she said that the way we work is that the city government comes with plans and then I as the environmental uh, NGO or environment expert, I make the critique, environment critique of those plans once I get the plans. So I don't get involved in the making of the plans. So that is the way I work. So that's why I'm waiting for other people to come with the plan. So this, this was a very interesting learn, learning moment for me because, you know, sometimes you think that stakeholder collaboration, the way of co-design, sitting down and doing something together comes naturally. But generally, uh, what I realize is this co-learning needs a lot of learning by everyone, but most importantly by the facilitators who are creating these co-learning experiences. You have to really look at, you know, what the backgrounds of the people and how familiar they are with these kind of settings and sometimes do some unlearning. That is, sometimes our education systems have made us to be very much tunnel vision. That is, we try to isolate ourselves in our own uh, disciplines, whether it's water quality, whether it's wastewater, whether it's uh, flooding, uh, whether it's social science, whether it's modeling. We are not that comfortable sometimes opening up and trying to learn together with others. Uh, so that is a one very important point. So here I make this statement that, you know, can be a little bit controversial. That is, I believe that we as experts, we have an extra burden to make sure that what we are trying to say is uh, conveyed well to a broad swath of uh, stakeholders and they can learn and understand so that they can contribute meaningfully. So, in other words, everyone has the right to an opinion, but if you don't facilitate learning in this context, everyone's opinion might not be right. So, it's, it's very important as, you know, as a domain expert for us to learn the way how we can make sure that stakeholders around us are aware and understand what we are talking about. So that communication is extremely important. This is another example of uh, uh, co-design workshop we did in Vietnam. This is mainly addressing uh, about the water supply problem in Ho Chi Minh City because because of climate change, the uh, you know sea level has risen, and all of a sudden the salinity in the river system that is the source for the water supply has increased. So the, everybody was in a panic mode, so we were helping the city government to think about uh, solutions for this crisis. This particular uh, workshop was attended by a uh, lot of local experts and local community uh, some of the community members from the local environment and also by a number of Dutch experts from Netherlands. So I was part of that uh, group. And in the beginning of this process, we observed that sometimes it's very difficult for us to remove the hat of uh, being a Dutch or being an expert of one country and try to open up and look at problems of completely or very different domain in another context. 
Um, so, in the beginning, we, we we saw some statements like, let's look at project X in Netherlands and let's try to implement that here, a similar project here, so that the problem will be solved. But somehow, towards the end of this one week exercise, we we realize uh, everybody was helped to realize that that's not the way to do. We can get inspiration from around the world, but when it when it comes to uh, proposing solutions, we have to adhere to what I call localism. Uh, one of the statements made by a director of the water company is very interesting here. He, he told on the last day, I thought you would try to push a Dutch solution because he, he was observing what's happening. But at the end, you came up with very nice designs that are appropriate to the Vietnamese context. So this is all of it about you know proper stakeholder engagement. You need to look get into the the complex realities of a particular problem, and stakeholders around you can help a great deal in achieving that insight. Uh, if you all have its a hammer everything might look like an A, but there is no single best that is applicable for everywhere in the world. So that is where the stakeholders can really help you to contextualize a problem and get insights about how you can come up with the local appropriate solutions for that problem. Finally, let's come back to the to a third time, let's come back to that city in Vietnam, Kanta City. You know, once I was talking about uh, the boss of the climate change adaptation unit of the city, and he told me a very interesting story. He was referring to a certain big project that have just concluded in the city, a research project funded by a developed country, uh, and what this person told me is that this project's outcome gave us the destination. That is, the city has this problem, so city has to achieve this kind of situation in order to uh, address that problem. But we knew that. He said that the problem we knew and what we, uh, the destination we have to reach, we knew. But what we needed was the steps to start that journey. That's another very important point when you discuss about this whole business of learning together with stakeholders. That is, you know, it's very easy for us to uh, uh, provide the so-called the shining city on a mountain and say that that is where we, you know, you should go. But, you know, that vision alone will not inspire and provide the pathway to go there. But it's equally important that you come up with incremental solutions that start with the reality that we are living in today in that particular context, and then how you can come up and start going up so that you can reach a better destination in the future. So visions are inspiring, but coming up with the process is the real challenge. And this is extremely important when we are dealing with stakeholders, because the moment you only discuss about a vision, everybody yeah, will turn out, because you, uh, I mean, visions are not very practical when it comes to implementing things. OK. So finally, let's summarize what we have been discussing. First. You know, I gave my own interpretation of why stakeholder engagement is so important in the domain of water. So obviously, I came up uh, with my own, ju own justification from the urban water cycle management. And my own reason for that was that the problems we are dealing with are uh, wicked, complex, and uncertain and urgent. So in that kind of context, we have to come up with flexible, multiple-valued uh, solutions. If we are to success in that kind of solutions, we need 
to engage a broad spectrum of stakeholders. So that was the first point I made. Then how and what needs to be done there? First of all, we have to be open for learning in order to succeed in stakeholder management and we have to impart that learning culture among our groups of stakeholders and we have to understand our problems are transdisciplinary, so the solutions are also transdisciplinary and stakeholders can help us to lead into local insights about problems and incremental solutions lead to learning cycles, so always promote incremental development and stakeholder engagement is about equal partnership. It's not somebody providing a technical solution and trying to explain it down to the others. And as experts in the world domain, we have extra responsibilities because we have to make sure that our expertise is delivered in such a way that others can understand what we are talking about so that they can meaningfully contribute to address our own problems because we alone cannot provide all the uh, local specific uh, solutions that we need for each city. And finally, I mean, I told you I'm a modeler and I am convinced that one of the most important roles of models, sometimes we call them virtual worlds, models is uh, not as an end but a means for broad learning. So models can sometimes help stakeholders learn. That is the reason why, the main reason why we should promote uh, models in this context of urban road cycle adaptation. So that's that's all I want to share with you today. So let's see whether we have uh, any questions, comments, or things like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asela. Yes, oh. indeed have some questions received, so I will put them up right now. The first one is uh, a, a bit more generic, so I'll put that one first. Monica Saruma from Uganda asks, is the SUDS approach, sustainable drainage system, similar to the IWRM approach? Can you say something about that? Yes, uh, the IWRM uh, is, is uh, can be looked at as a superset of sustainable drainage systems because IWRM is about uh, looking at the nature base, uh, well, looking at the interconnectedness uh, of uh, the water cycle in the uh, in the catchment level or urban level or at every level. But uh, uh, the sustainable drainage systems is specifically in cities. We look at these uh, so-called green solutions, how they can help uh, to solve this interconnected uh, water problem. So Monica, you're right, because there is a, a very strong connection between the two terms, uh, though they are not exactly the same thing. Okay, the next question from Brian Emmy. He agrees true stakeholder engagement is key throughout the project. However, can the associated challenges of speculation and land acquisition be managed in countries where government does not own land? So you have some experience in that or some advice? Well, I don't have experience on that because that was not, not, not a problem that I have dealt with in uh, my limited experience. But, but it's a very interesting question because um, uh, the let's um, let's uh, break your question into two parts because one one part is specific that is about this particular issue of land acquisition. So uh, and the other part is the 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 generic issue that is generic complexity that is arising from you know stakeholder engagement. So uh, when the government does not own the land. Actually, that is all the more reason sometimes you have to go out of the way in order to convince uh, the people because these landowners are also very important part of the stakeholder spectrum there. So, um, you know, sometimes proper stakeholder engagement might help 
to convince landowners that you know this is a worthwhile activity to do uh, and to to relent but at the same time it that kind of process can help other parties to understand okay where are they coming from what are their real problems so then once you understand those real problems because it becomes a uh, rather than a negotiation it becomes a situation where you try to understand each other's positions and try to see how you can make synergy out of uh, that kind of context now i want to expand very quickly to the other part of that question of i mean that is the stakeholder engagement aren't we inviting for trouble by trying to make it too complex sometimes uh, the answer on the surface could be yes because you know the old fashioned way that we uh, especially engineers we thought that you know we uh, we know the solutions to the problem so if we are given the freedom to to act the world will be a better place but when we encounter more and more complex solutions we slowly are realizing that whether you are an engineer or a social scientist or a environment specialist or whatever you are it there are only there are only so many problems that you can effectively solve uh, solve by only looking at your own domain and by domain i don't even limit this discussion to the circle of experts you have to go beyond sometimes because some of the uh, knowledge learning experiences come from outside so called traditional expertise so that is where this complexity is well worthwhile Com complexities you encounter by stakeholder engagement is well worthwhile because then you really understand the problem rather than wishing it away very clear i have a um, few other questions and i want to put two at the same time so yeah. first of all Caroline L asks how do you deal with competing and conflicting stakes from stakeholders I think that's something um, we all might recognize and also what are then um, meaningful contributions by stakeholders I think halfway during the presentation you mentioned that but what is that actually yeah yeah the you know uh, the uh, again I you have to understand that I am not an expert of mediation or uh, or negotiation techniques or anything like that so i'm a poor civil engineer who is wearing a different hat here but from my experience what i uh, can tell you is this now the uh, you can look at uh, uh, everybody's position from a negotiating point of view but at the same time when you try to uh, get people to sit around in a in a table and to do what we call co design that is you come up you put your knowledge on the table and then try to work together to achieve a common objective and it's very important that you understand and you agree about that common objective as well once you do those things actually what i have observed uh, repeatedly in different context sometimes even i can say irrespective of the the culture specific cultures people open up you need little bit of time for that sometimes you i mean i told you that this vietnam experience we took about one week and ma many other stakeholder experiences were like that like there were sometimes we had workshops that you know lasted for four or five days continuously but in those processes what you notice is that the moment you uh, become the moment you uh, you know open up to the and understand each other little bit and that happens when you start talking about uh, talking around the table sometimes and then uh, it becomes more of a, okay let's together you know try to solve this problem rather than you know this is my position and this is somebody else's position mm -hmm. <clears throat> and maybe related to this you say people need to open up and somebody asks um, I'll just put it up now in the case of Vietnam so how broad deep can stakeholder engagement really be in a one party state like Vietnam so you already mentioned that during the workshop it took a week to op open up but how do you think um, is this a sustainable way of engagement 
Could you say something on that? Yeah. Uh, the, again, I mean, uh, from my limited experience about how things worked in the Vietnamese society and the Vietnamese system of governance, is that, you know, sometimes you, from a, as an outsider, I had this uh, mental caricature about how does this one, one party system work before I went there and before I try to understand that. Then you think that everything will be very monolithic, but what you realize is like any other system of governance, it has its own intricacies, complexities, and within the this monolith of so-called governance structure, within that you have your own enclaves. You know, the half of the problem in, in many situations in Vietnam was to get to the different departments in the government to talk to each other. So that is not something you expect in a one-party system uh, when you look at it from a simplistic way. But once you go in and see that, you know, similar things to what is happening in uh, democracies happen there as well. And when you look at the uh, social context there again, I mean, again, it's far from uh, somebody implementing all the rules so every, everything is structured and so on. Because what you see is that one of the biggest problems in my domain in Vietnam is uh, illegal settlements in cities. They are not uh, really, uh, really not slums, but people try to expand their houses, try to live in places where they are not supposed to live. But again, this is a contradiction from uh, the you know, caricature we had about this one-party system where everything is implemented. It's far from it. Actually, in that context, I see Netherlands has been much more uh, well-regulated, much more well-regulated in terms of where people are supposed to live and not compared to, compared to Vietnam. So, um, yeah, uh, even though there are limits, uh, there are certain realities that you have to adhere to depending on the system you are operating in. Um, still, stakeholder engagement is very much needed. But one, one of the, uh, one of the uh, shortcomings that we saw in Vietnam was that the uh, level of engagement of uh, community organizations were less in our own particular work, but most of the stakeholders were coming from different government uh, departments and so on. But that I see largely as a limitation of what uh, our reach rather than the absence of that kind of organizations. Yeah, that, that's uh, again my personal observation. Yeah, that's, nice. that's why I would like to hear from you. And um, another question uh, country specific. So Monica asks, what should cities in low developing countries which were planned since colonial times without putting future drainage challenges into consideration do? Yeah, that, that is, you know, that is the uh, classical challenge we are facing in what I term, what I coined as urban adaptation in these cities. Uh, because on the one hand, we have this, um, uh, we have these two situations about future. That is, on the one hand, there is a very huge uncertainty, and at the same time, uh, we have a big urgency to act. Another dimension to look at these kind of situations is that what we call, uh, uh, I might use a technical term here, we call adaptation uh, gaps and adaptation deficits. If you look at a city in the global north, generally, even though I'm generalizing here, generally the problems are largely in the domain of adaptation gaps. That is how you can adapt to a future threats in the city. But when you are dealing with a developing city, you have significant adaptation deficits as well. That means today the status quo is far from satisfactory. Population has grown up and our water system is struggling to cope up with this and our drainage system is struggling to cope up with, city is polluted. So how you can deal with that? But at the same time, you have to look at how you can deal with a future that is coming, because you have to balance the both. So it's much more complex in developing cities compared to developed cities, if I may say so, because 
uh, of this competing situation. That's even more reason to go for this incremental, flexible, multiple valued solutions because every dollar you spend, you have to justify from the point of view of today's benefit. From that, I jump into another uh, explanation that is, if you look at what is a good city to live in, people explain that from the terms of sustainability, resilience and durability. Sustainability is the long term viability of the city. Resilience is that when you face with shocks, how you can deal with that. Livability is that, you know, here and now, how you can make the city better. So what I always propose is try to connect these three together. Sustainability and resilience should not ex exist independent of livability. Because once you make that livability argument, then what you are doing is we are providing something for the uh, community and the stakeholders in the city that has immediate benefit. So if you look at it as multifaceted multiple value solutions, then you can connect that together with this, uh, you know, long term endeavors like uh, sustainability and resilience. Because sustainability and, ability and resilience are not things that are very close to our heart in the day to day life. Because we worry about that later sometimes. But um, Livability is very close. So if you can integrate these two, and you can integrate that by looking at these multiple value solutions with a proper stakeholder backdrop, then yes, you can you can achieve, uh, you can overcome those challenges. Ah, I think with that answer, you have also answered another question of uh, Mr. Prakash. So what I'm doing, I put up um, a question that can maybe give us some idea back to the whole um, concept that you were telling. Louisa asks, how can you agree on learning in a transdisciplinary and international context? And how can you unlearn? So that was one of your latest slides where you have put that. How can we actually do that if we want to implement that? Yeah, uh, what I mean by unlearn there is that, you know, somehow we I am a product of a very traditional education system. So I come from there. So what we learned is that the way we learned is this divide and conquer way, way of learning. So we divide the subject into different sub areas and then we develop our expertise in the sub areas. And as we progress in our education, we focus on much narrower areas as we go up. I mean, this is very good to develop, you know, uh, develop domain knowledge. But what we sometimes forget in this process is that most of the problems that we are at the end trying to solve in the world are not narrowed to that, that domain alone. So while we are uh, improving our depth in one of the areas, at the same time, we have to keep on reminding ourselves that it's important to have the breadth. So there are two ways of having this breadth. One is that, you know, the obvious way, that is you become a little bit broader. The other is the develop the transferable skills that you need to engage with experts in the other areas, to engage with communities, so that you can gain insights from multiple group of people. So, uh, so that is what I uh, meant by unlearn. Unlearn is that don't get uh, get into this uh, ivory tower of you know, specialization, once in a while, just look around a little bit and and also develop the necessary skills that are needed to deal with uh, people who are using a different language, sometimes metaphorically, like, you know, language of water quality versus language of water, water supply and flooding, or sometimes literally, people who speak a different language. So you need skills because, for example, some of these workshops that I talked to you about we have to do it together with translators because we don't speak each other's languages. So sometimes you have to um, very carefully design those things so that that uh, mother tongue experience happens around the tables. But at the same time, we, the people who do not speak that language, can also uh, meaningfully contribute. So those are the challenges that you have to deal with. Yeah. Thank you very much for this answer. And then, uh, seeing the time, I would like to ask the last question, which is maybe also the most challenging. But we've seen many of your examples and experience in uh, Vietnam, uh, in Asia. But now, um, Olukoi asks, 
What is your advice in terms of water governance in African cities? Any experience there or things that you would like to share with us? Well, um, I have done some work uh, related to African context. For example, I have done several capacity building uh, projects in topics like infrastructure, asset management, water supply systems, and so on. But uh, my, uh, my, uh, based on my experience, my current viewpoint is that, you know, when we look at these problems, the context at, is very important because solutions are very much context specific. But at the same time, there are very big common nature about these problems as well, whether you deal with Africa, Latin America, or Asia, right? But uh, sometimes the, the point of departure of these problems, especially when you look at the water cycle issues, point of departure might be different. I'll give you an example from a different example that recently we were dealing, we were having a collaboration, very interesting collaboration between Netherlands and Australia about this domain of multiple value and urban green solutions and so on. And you know, something interesting came up, that is Netherlands entered this whole foray of uh, green uh, issues uh, from the viewpoint of too much water. Uh, Australia came up with the same uh, direction from the point of view of too little water. But what we all agree at the end is that whether we come from the flooding point of view or from the drought point of view or the water quality point of view, finally we have to look at that whole circle. Yeah? Then we, have, we see the commonality everywhere because wherever you are, you are dealing with the whole interconnected water cycle. Uh, so there is a very big commonality. But at the same time, I have to repeat this, that is when you are looking at solutions, it's very, very important to look at the local context of a problem. Yeah. Um. Very clear. <clears throat> I think we leave it here. I see there are still some questions coming in. But we can. Uh, what we will do, we will upload the video and also the presentation. And people can always contact us and then we can put you in contact uh, with um, Dr. Asella. So for now, I would really like to thank you for the presentation. Um, for me personally, I really enjoyed the metaphor of um, comparing it to health. I think that gave a lot of insight. And I want to thank also people at IHG, Wim, Raquel and Maria over there. And I can already announce that the next alumni webinar and partners will be organized in the first week of May. But you will be keep posted on that. And for now, um, I would like to say goodbye and the recordings can be found on the Water Channel later on. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.